June Hever was one of the stars that made it to the top of Hollywood by signing and acting for 20th Century Fox. But her experience with the studio was far more evil than it looked. There even came the point when all the actress would ever dream about was leaving Fox for good. So, what did Hever do to them? Or, what did they do to her? Keep on watching to find out. But before we get into the video, make sure to subscribe to the channel and leave a comment below saying I subscribed and we'll do our best to reply to your comment personally. How did June Hever make it in Hollywood? June Hever was born June Stovner on June 10th, 1926 in Rock Island, Illinois. She was the only child of a vaudeville song and dance couple. Her father was a well-known comic and her mother had retired from performing to raise June. By the time she was five years old, Hever had appeared with her parents in short films made for RKO Pictures. She later took the last name of her stepfather, Bert Hever, and would use it as her stage name later on. After the family moved to Ohio, seven-year-old Hever entered and won a Cincinnati Conservatory of Music contest. At age 10, she moved back to Rock Island, where she began performing for Rudy Vallée. At age 13, she made her film debut in the 1933 film Meet the Baron. And that same year, she appeared in two other films. She then officially signed with RKO Radio Pictures. During the Depression period at age 14, Hever worked as a child model and actress. Known as Baby June, she appeared in several films for RKO Pictures, including the 1932 film Tom Brown of Culver and the Our Gang comedy series. She then worked as a soloist on radio and became a regular performer on Rudy Vallée's variety show, The Fleischmann's Yeast Hour. During that period, she became a band vocalist with Ben Pollock. However, her first starring role came at age 15 when she played opposite Fred Astaire in the 1935 musical comedy Romeo and Juliet, for which she received excellent reviews. Her next film was also a musical with Astaire, 1936's Follow the Fleet, which was a major success at the box office, earning over one million in profits during its initial theatrical release. Hever showed up in Hollywood in 1936 where she landed another contract with RKO Radio Pictures. She had cameos in several movies including The Big Broadcast of 1937, The Singing Marine, and Alexander's Ragtime Band. She also made appearances in several Busby Berkeley musicals, including Stage Extra Work and Broadway Melody of 1938, College Swing, and Babes in Arms. The actress's big break finally came when she signed with 20th Century Fox. She starred in several films, including Little Miss Smiles, Every Day's a Holiday, The Lone Wolf Spy Hunt, and Lillian Russell. She also performed at various functions including benefits that raise money for the Hollywood Anti-Nazi League. One of these was organized by Orson Welles on March 10, 1938 at the Shrine Auditorium in Los Angeles, which raised 45000 for Spanish loyalists fighting Franco's fascists during the Spanish Civil War. Hever then continued with her first musical for 20th Century Fox, which was the World War II morale booster, Thousands Cheer, followed by another all-star spectacle, The Gang's All Here. Sadly, neither film was considered a musical, and both were box office disappointments. But the actress's popularity only increased. With her fourth picture, Janie Gets Married, co-starring Mac Murray and Hedy Lamarr, Hever made a name for herself. She followed this up with another all-star extravaganza, Hollywood Canteen, including Beings Crosby, John Garfield, and Betty Davis. Then in the early 1940s, she appeared in a string of musicals such as Moon Over Miami, Tulsa, and Springtime and the Rockies. The comedies were well received by critics and audiences alike, and the actress was on the rise. However, her status as a Fox contract player and her reputation as a Fox girl in general would soon be called into question. The studio system in Hollywood in the 1940s and 50s was notorious for its treatment of contract players. Actresses were routinely slighted when it came to billing, screen time, and choice of roles. Sometimes they were even asked to do such degrading things as stand fully clothed on shore while waves crash over them. But with no other option available, these women often had to put up with it. Many actresses who found themselves working for studios other than Fox did so after being dismissed by the studio for being difficult. In some cases, they were known to have gotten into arguments with their bosses or gotten pregnant out of wedlock. Hever did not fall into this category. However, she did have an issue with the way 20th Century Fox was using her during her career. 
She felt she was being mistreated, and just like many others, she finally left the studio after six years of working with them. In 1940, she appeared in The Great Profile starring W.C. Fields. The following year, she appeared in John Ford's Western film, Drums Along the Mohawk. And in 1942, Hever landed her best-known role as Shirley Temple's best friend, Susan Peters, in the film adaptation of Bright Eyes, which led her to being nicknamed the other Shirley Temple. In 1950, Hever was signed to RCA Records. During the next two years, she had several hits on the charts, including Baby Doll, Yes Sir, That's My Baby, and I Love You So Much It Hurts. She was also offered several television roles, but declined them to concentrate on her singing career. The most successful of this early period was Heartbreak Hotel, which she debuted on her NBC television show and later recorded and released as a single. It became her first million seller. The recording sold over one million copies and was awarded a gold disc by the RIAA in August 1956. Hever became one of the few country music singers to cross over into pop music in this period, along with Elvis Presley and Johnny Cash. Her popularity continued through the 1960s with such hits as The End of the World, It's All in the Game, and Don't Send Me Roses. But what about her personal life? It was during the filming of Lillian Russell that Hever met her future husband, Fred McMurray. Working with McMurray did not interfere with her career, but allowed her to spend more time at home. Even after marriage, she kept busy in television as well as films. In 1953, she co-starred with George Reeves in the movie No Place Like Homicide, and in 1956, she starred in the television version of The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet. Hever later returned to the films with a role in the McConnell story. Here, she was cast as the wife of James Whitmore, who portrayed a real-life baseball player who died from head injuries received during a game. Hever became pregnant with their first child during the filming of Baby Sits and gave birth to fraternal twin sons on May 30, 1955. The boys were named Christopher Paul after her brother and Peter Gray after McMurray's brother. They would later have a third child together, Patrick Ryan, born November 27, 1958. According to June, he had a big temper, which she would quickly learn to deal with. As her children grew older, she began working less frequently. In 1959, she had a supporting role as a secretary in The Miracle. But it was during this time that her husband became an alcoholic, and Hever's desire to help him stop drinking led to the discovery that she suffered from the same addiction. She then entered a sanitarium for treatment with McMurray by her side. Her experience there inspired her to quit drinking forever. Afterwards, she said, I'd rather have a piece of chocolate cake than drink any day. Hever's last movie with McMurray was The Shaggy Dog in 1959, which also starred her daughter. A year later, she made The Horse Without a Head with Vincent Price, which turned out to be a box office failure. Her final screen appearance would be in Operation Eekman. I really wonder what Fox did to Hever to make her leave. Do you think they went as far as to cause her physical pain? Let me know in the comment section and check out the following video in this series.